Welcome to American Dog Culture. We're searching all over the country to bring you stories from dog owners, trainers, and industry professionals that are living the American dog culture. Today, we visit with Duck Team 6, who's captured hundreds of dogs from the streets and found permanent loving homes for them. Then, we visit with the Friends of the Katy Trail, a nonprofit group that's keeping the trails clean, safe, and beautiful. But first, we visit Dallas Dog and Disc, who's promoting the sport of canine disc as a great way to keep your dogs healthy and happy. Well, Chuck, thanks for meeting us out here today. You're welcome. Dallas uh, Dog and Disc Club has been around since 1986. Yes, so, we have. Quite a long time. Wow. Tell us a little about the history of it. Well, we're actually the very first club in the world. I used to say we were the very first Frisbee Dog Club in the nation, but uh, Frisbee Dog is worldwide now, from Asia all the way through South America and Europe. Wow. And so there are Frisbee Dog Clubs everywhere from Chile in the south to Canada in the north, as far east as Japan, and as far west as, I'm going to guess, Poland or the Czech Republic. So it's, it's huge now. And it's really grown. And it started off as, a, as an idea. Yeah, it started off as an idea by Ron Ellis here in Dallas, Texas, back in uh, sometime 1986. And he just came up with the concept, which was revolutionary at the time, of just getting together once a month, second Saturday of every month, at a park, and letting our dogs play Frisbee. And, you know, we can go to the park and play Frisbee at any time, right? right. So it was more about the camaraderie and building the friendships around the sport and around the common interest. How do you train a dog to, to play Frisbee? Well. Some of them come by it kind of naturally. Yeah. When I first got into the sport and didn't know any different, I actually gave them water. They had a water bowl, a water dish, and a food dish. Both of them were Frisbees. And then inside the house, I just would scoot the Frisbee around, roll it around, praise them, and before you know it, you had a dog that would chase, catch, and retrieve. So, Chuck, who do we have here today? This is Bam Bam. Bam, Bam. He's about a uh, six and a half year old now, Australian Shepherd. They call him a Red Merle. And uh, he's actually a two time world champion. Wow. Yeah, so, so Bam Bam's a, Bam Bam's more famous than me. What tricks are we practicing today? Today, we're just going to have a little, what we call a fun match, which is just throw and catch. Uh, and uh, that's kind of his specialty, although he knows a lot of tricks. He was actually, uh, so there are two elements in our sport. There is uh, the throw and catch element, and then what we call the freestyle event. Freestyle event is where you have a minute and a half to two minutes to just go out there and what we call jam. It's just freestyle. Do what you want to do, showcase your dog's ability. Ready? Good boy, bam bam, let's go, come on. He actually was the North American uh, freestyle champion last year in the uh, UFO organization, so. What are the dogs getting out of this? What they get out of it is a really fun activity that keeps them in phenomenal condition. And uh, thin and uh, just well conditioned. What kind of Frisbees, are, are these special Frisbees that you're well, using? They are, they are dog-friendly discs. And when I say dog-friendly, if you were to go to a, a major retail store, chances are the Frisbee you're going to find there is what they play ultimate with. This is about a 109-gram Frisbee, and those big ones are about 175. This is a dog-specific disc. There are a few places online where you can buy them. But uh, it's got a sh smaller lip. It's lightweight and uh, won't break their teeth. It doesn't matter how big or how small your dog is. You can teach the biggest of dogs and the smallest of dogs to play this sport. I guess probably I've seen dogs play this sport that are over 100 pounds and I've seen dogs as small as five pounds play this sport. Now, if you took a five pound dog out there with this disc, it'd be a little bit challenging, but that's why we have the smaller discs for the smaller dogs. So you wanna go? You want to go try one? Let's do it. All right. 
When we come back, we learn how to throw disc with 10-time world champion Chuck Middleton. There you go. Take sit. Dogs need lots of exercise, and one way is with a game of Frisbee. Jake, you want to play? We meet with 10-time world champion Chuck Middleton to learn how to throw a Frisbee. Jake, middle. There you go. Let's go. Go get the Frisbee. Go. Bam, bam. Come around. Okay, that's a catch. There Woo! you go. Good job. Wow, that's so much fun. <laughs> Good job. Wow. I need, to, so, I need to get my dog out here. So, yeah. Ab what kind of dog do you have? It's a black lab mix. Okay, sit. So, show you what it's supposed to look like. We have to keep changing frisbees. On your marks. Get set. Go. Wow. Good boy, Bam Bam. That's amazing. Good boy. If it didn't, if it didn't get you muddy, I'd let you do this. Good boy. Good boy. Let's see if he'll do a flip for you. So here's what I want you to do. Ready? Just throw it up right over his head. Good boy. Wow. Good boy. OK, ready? All right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Bam Bam. OK, you talk to him and say, are you ready? All right. You want it? And you get down here, right in front of him. You just toss it up right above his head. Bam Bam, are you ready? You want it? Good job. Wow. That is amazing. Good boy. And then once you get really proficient at this, you know, there are all sorts of these little tricks we can do. Come around. Sit. Sit. We call these vaults where they actually jump off of you. We don't want to ruin your shirt, so let me just demonstrate. Okay. Ready? Set. Okay. Good boy. Wow where they actually use a portion of your body to actually vault into the air and catch the disc. So what we were doing right there, right, is the very basics of our sport, throw and catch. The dog chases, catches, retrieves. At least we hope they catch, right? That's the object of the game, catch. But then the other aspect of this sport is what we call the freestyle, which is quite literally just freestyle. Do whatever you do and your dog do well together and showcase their athleticism and the tricks. So, come here, baby. So, you end up having flips. Wow. Like that. You end up having dogs, you know, run through your legs, under your legs. Come on, up. Come here. Come on. Okay, come on, up. Good. And then, oh, bam, bam. And obviously, even in freestyle, the object is to catch the disc rather than do what I just did and have it drop. Because in competition, we have basically four aspects in freestyle. So we got presentation, success, wow factor, and then, and then there's a dog category. How athletic is the dog doing the tricks that you tried to uh, get him to do? Ready, set, okay, come on. Good, come on. Good boy. Wow. Good boy. Now, obviously, today. It's amazing how high he's jumping compared yeah. to the size dog this is. Yeah, and really athletic dogs. And, and the sport's phenomenal as far as just how strong they are. I mean, if you reach back and you feel his legs, I mean, he's like muscled up. Yeah. And he's real lean. He's very lean. Yeah. You couldn't ask a dog to do what we asked them to do with an overweight dog, mm -hmm. which, uh, which he's not, obviously. He looks overweight just because he's got a lot of hair. It's a lot of hair, but he's there's the no only, fat there. He's the only one out here this morning that's not cold, I think. So, cool stuff. Yeah. Cool stuff. Well, thanks for teaching me how to throw yeah. a Frisbee. Now all you just need to do, I should, I'm going to give you a couple of Frisbees, and you can take them home to your dog. Great. That? that sounds good. Thank you so much. Welcome back. 
Pet health is important to our dog's quality of life. This week we visit with Dr. Kendrick in Mansfield, Texas for this week's Pet Health and Safety Tip. There are a number of different ways that you can tell when your dog is actually gaining too much weight. Uh, we tend to refer those uh, to those in the room as fluffy dogs. Uh, they get a little bit big and it's easy to tell. One of the most important ways that you can tell if your dog is getting fat is if you put your fingers on its rib cage and just kind of run down the side of the rib, as a general rule of thumb, you should be able to feel the ribs without being able to see the ribs. There should be right behind the rib cage an indention, and then you can run your fingers along the backbone, and then you should get another widening out at the hips, or your so-called figure eight appearance when you're actually feeling them and looking at them. Obviously, feel becomes much more important in the big, thick, furred dogs as opposed to the small, uh, short-haired dogs where you can actually see a lot more. Some of the health problems that, would, that can result from a dog or a cat being obese, most of the ones that we see initially are simply going to be immobility. These dogs are going to have a difficult time getting up and getting outside. They're going to be in pain. A lot of that has to do not just with actual mechanical weight issues putting pressure on the joints. We do know now that in obesity, dogs are going to develop very similar to humans, they're going to develop some fat pads inside the body along the backbone. And when they do, when they get to a certain point, those fat pads become very metabolically important and they start actually producing enzymes and hormones and other natural chemicals that can actually have a direct acting effect on the joint tissue itself and cause destruction. So it's no longer just a mechanical issue, it becomes a chemical issue within the body. And so that further decreases their ability to move around. Diabetes is another consequence of, of being overweight. Uh, when you have a dog that's overweight, uh, they have an abundance of fat molecules that are constantly circulating through the liver. It tends to impede normal uh, metabolism of the gut and it causes the pancreas to tend to overproduce insulin. After a long period of time, the beta cells in the pancreas no longer produce enough insulin because they're basically worn out. And when that happens, dogs become diabetic. So the signs that we see with diabetes most common are this, what we call the four hallmark signs. The dogs get excessively thirsty, they tend to urinate a lot, they tend to eat more food than they should, yet those dogs frequently begin losing weight and sometimes it can be very dramatic. And so sometimes folks get confused into thinking, oh, look how much more energetic my dog is. He's losing weight and he's getting thin again. When in reality, there can be some serious consequences uh, from diabetes. The most important thing for an owner to do when they feel like their pet may be gaining too much weight is again, visit the veterinarian. The veterinarian is going to be able to evaluate this issue as, as to whether it's primarily a weight issue or if there are some underlying metabolic problems such as diabetes, Cushing's disease, uh, hypothyroidism, a lot of endocrine diseases can have a lot of play with their weight as well. Welcome back. The Katy Trail in Dallas is a great place to walk our dogs. The friends of the Katy Trail are doing a great job to keep the trail safe, clean, and beautiful. Let's check it out. Lauren, this is an amazing place for the city of Dallas. It's right in the middle of an urban environment. It's a great place to walk your dogs and take your family out for a walk. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of the Katy Trail. Absolutely. Well, we're actually standing on what used to be the Missouri-Texas-Kansas Railroad. So that was called the MKT, and then it got shortened to, people started calling it the KT Railroad, and now it's commonly the Katy Railroad. So uh, the railroad was actually built in about 1860s it started. Um, in about 1880s it started running through Dallas. So for years the Katy Railroad ran right through here. Um, there were stops all around the area and a lot of the people in the area will tell you about the history that they loved you know, having the trains go through the city. But then obviously as time progressed um, and about the 1990s, the train stopped running through here and it just became abandoned railroad. Um, the area became kind of dilapidated and the community really got together and thought, we need to turn this area into something great. And the Friends of the Katy Trail was formed 
um, by a group of people in the community in 1997. So that's when the whole plan started coming into action. And then it wasn't until about 2000, 2003, when actual, the actual trail started to be laid. So the city of Dallas actually owns the parkland, but they don't have the means to take care of this area um, as everyone in the community would want it to be. So the Friends of the Katy Trail is responsible for um, funding all the landscape you see along the trail, all the utility bills, so the light bills, the water bills. We hire off-duty police officers to patrol the trail. So we really keep it safe, beautiful, clean for um, the entire city, for the community to enjoy. And a lot of what you do is through fundraising, and you guys have a big fundraising event coming up, the 5K Run. We do. Our Michelob Ultra Katy 5K is our largest fundraiser of the year. It sells out every year because it's so much fun. Uh, we have more than uh, 50 restaurants that come out and hand out food, and then plus the Michelob Ultra. So the race is great, but a lot of people come for the Katy Picnic afterwards where you get that free food, free beer, um, and it's just, we, have a, we always have a live band, so it's, it's a lot of fun. A lot of what you do can't be possible without the help of volunteers. Absolutely, we have great volunteers. We have a wonderful board uh, that help, it, help guide us all year long. We have different committees. We have volunteers that come out and help us for events. We do multiple fundraising events along the trail. Um, and then people will just come out and sit at a table with us and catch people as they're going by to um, help uh, let the community know why we're here and what we're doing. Uh, I think it's estimated that 20,000 people are on the trail every week. Wow. But we only have about 1,000 contributing members. Um, so we really need to spread the word that it's not city tax dollars that fund the Katy Trail. It's uh, memberships, it's private donations, it's our fundraisers. That's what pays for everything you see out here. So let's talk about dogs. There's a lot of dogs on the trail. Absolutely, we love dogs on the Katy Trail. Uh, I'm a huge dog fan myself. I bring my dogs out here all the time. Uh, we love seeing dogs out here. We just ask that when people come out with their dogs, of course, keep them on a leash, keep them on a short leash. So we don't want them on a long leash running all around because we have bikers, kids. So, you know, keep them by our side and keep them under control. As long as they're friendly, we love any kind of dog out here on the Katy Trail. Well, very good. Lauren, thank you so much You're for so spending welcome. time with us. And Absolutely. We'll, we'll see you soon. All right, come back anytime. Thank you. Duck Team 6 is rescuing dogs off the streets of Dallas, and they're finding great homes for them. We get a chance to ride out with Duck Team 6 and see just how they're doing it. Let's check it out. JP, thank you so much for meeting with us today. And you guys are doing something extraordinary. You're actually going out and capturing dogs in, on the street. Yep, that's our uh, primary uh, function is uh, we saw a need that we had a lot of strays on the streets of Dallas. And we, we do have animal services and stuff like that in the city. However, they're so overwhelmed and understaffed um, that that's what we were good at is uh, catching dogs on the streets. I have myself 10-15 years of dog behavior uh, studies under me and a lot of our other volunteers uh, know a lot about dogs and their behavior and just extreme passion and that combo makes uh, a good team to go out and catch the dogs. Great. How did Duck Team 6 come to be? What's your, what's your mission? Well, how we came to be was we accidentally became organized uh, a few years ago. Uh, we had started um, uh, with one dog uh, that was running down LBJ and jamming up traffic and things like that. And a friend of mine, uh, Richard Hunter, who used to be a radio personality here in Dallas, uh, big, animal, uh, big animal lover, uh, was trying to catch this one dog and needed some help. So I helped him train one of his dogs. So he called me and said, can you help me catch this dog? Sure, no problem. Uh, so I went out there and met uh, one of our other founders, Yvonne, uh, Ibarra, and we started trying to catch this dog, and eventually we caught him, and, or caught her, and then it just kind of started to, uh, the, you know, the, the, it started to grow a little bit. The word got out, and then we got another call. And then the word got out, and then we got another call to catch uh, a dog out in Oak Cliff, and that's where we met uh, Rekka, which is another one of our founders. 
and uh, current board members as well. And uh, and just after that, the word just kept going, getting out, and we would go and do our best to catch these dogs because we have the time, well, theoretically we have the time to dedicate our resources to one dog. Yeah, because you guys uh, all have full-time careers also. Yeah, everybody has, uh, most everybody has full-time jobs during the daytime. Uh, so a lot of this is, you know, before work, lunch hour, after work, and weekends. And uh, there's no schedule. You know, unfortunately, a lot of these uh, loose dogs, you know, don't, don't, don't get the memo that we're coming out at 2 o'clock, please be ready to get caught. Uh, so sometimes it's a phone call at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, sometimes it's a call at you know ten o'clock in the morning before you come out to the Elpo event. Hey, we need to go try and track down some puppies. Uh, so it's it's a it's very hectic. Uh, it's in uh, a lot of time it's very chaotic, but we do our best and we've got an amazing team, amazing team of volunteers. Uh, that without them it just wouldn't be possible. These dogs have huge territories that they roam. You know, you could say, oh, this dog will be here at 2 o'clock. Right. But the dog could be a mile away. And they just know these territories. We caught a dog, Sophie, who is still out there. We caught her uh, by Fair Park, put her in a crate, put her in an SUV, drove her up to the M Streets where her foster was. Sadly, she got out that night. She really freaked out and got out. The next day, she was eight miles back where we caught her. I mean, just amazing dogs. Uh, so it does take driving the neighborhoods, trying to find these dogs, working with uh, the local residents of the neighborhood, stretching through you know, thorny bushes and you know, mud and under houses and under bridges and in drainage dishes. So it, 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 uh, uh, it takes quite a, deal, quite a bit of effort to get these guys. We won't pull a dog off the street until we know where it's going. Because uh, we, what we don't want to do is go out and get all these dogs and then warehouse them. Right. You know, stick them in kennels and stuff like that. And Because what happens is uh, people forget about them. Oh, they caught him, he's safe. We don't have to worry about that dog anymore. Uh, but a lot of times what we also try to do is work with our local rescues that already exist, like Elpo, where we are today, and hand dogs off to them that you know, could be highly adoptable and can be adopted quickly with dedicated resources. What that does is it frees us up so we can go back on the streets and catch more dogs. And uh, so that way we can keep the cycle going. We do have dogs in our care. Uh, a lot of the dogs that we have take a little longer to adopt because we're actually working with them, uh, putting them through training. Uh, we have a behaviorist that uh, goes to foster homes and works with our dogs. Uh, she does an amazing job. Because uh, yeah, these dogs are basically living in the wild in an urban environment. Yeah, yeah. So they have to go through a transition period yeah. of you know, getting used to humans and getting ready to live in a home with a family. Yes. And some of them you pick off the street and they're ready to go. Right. You know, they're just, they're all fantastic dogs. But some of them have that, the social skill and adaptability where they can just get put in and boom, they're ready to go. Uh, we, still have, we still have a serious problem in Dallas, uh, in the city of Dallas in regards to loose dogs and the stray population or neighborhood dogs. But uh, I think when we're all working together, all our rescue groups, you know, team up, and hopefully our goal is to, we're no longer needed. I think that's the goal of every rescue, yeah. is to go out of business. Um, and, and hopefully that's achievable at some point in time. Well, JP, thank you so much for spending yeah. time with us. We Absolutely. love all that Duck Team 6 is well, doing. Well, thank you. We're very grateful that you're, that you're here and invited us. Uh, so we're very thankful. Thank you very much. Yep. Be sure to like us on Facebook and visit our website. If you have a story or a tip you'd like to share with us, we'd like to hear about it. That's it for today. We'll see you next time.